On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with author and past president of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, Nancy Evans Bush. I think this is exactly the kind of talking about this stuff that we don't need to do. What the heck could this possibly mean? I think the most frustrating aspect of this whole study is simply trying to get people to sit quietly and just listen to the experiences let go of their preconceptions for a few minutes and just sit quietly and think, huh, what could this mean? What can we really say at the end of the day? I mean, we can say that materialism is clearly a failed proposition and that to the extent that, that we're still mired in it, we need to consider what lies beyond. But I'm not really sure what else we can say beyond that? For me, one of the frustrations is the numbers of people who, given a little bit of information, will jump in and say, oh, I get it. I had one of these experiences. I can tell you what it means. But I think we are still following breadcrumbs through the woods. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we have an interview with Nancy Evans Bush about distressing, negative, hellish NDEs. We really wind up talking about a lot of other topics that I think are particularly germane to the larger questions that Skeptico deals with. It was a delight to talk to Nancy. Here's the interview. Today, we welcome Nancy Evans Bush to Skeptico. Nancy is the former president of IANS, the International Association for Near Death Studies, and she's also the author of Dancing Past the Dark Distressing Near Death Experiences. Nancy, welcome and thanks for joining me today on Skeptico. Thanks, Alex. So, Nancy, this is quite an interesting, fascinating book that you've written. I know that it's caused a little bit of a stir inside the near-death experience community and the scientific community in, in, in broader terms. I've heard about this book. It's kind of popped up, and people bring it to my attention from a number of people. So, first of all, you have to congratulate someone on that. You've, you've obviously uh, struck a nerve with this book. Tell us a little bit about why you sought to write it and what you were hoping to do with the book. When I was in my late 20s, uh, I had an experience during the birth of my second baby. And it was an experience I, I could not account for, I could not explain, I could not understand. Uh, because essentially it was, this was years before near-death experiences were known about. And I had, um, I had no context for her understanding what it was or how to make sense of it. It did not fit with my theological life. It did not fit with anything. And because it was an experience essentially of being annihilated, um, there was there was no place to put it. So I buried it. If I can just interject, when you say you were annihilated, there were these little beings you encountered in this deep, dark void as part of your near-death experience. And as I understand it, your near-death experience starts out, as many near-death experiences start, you left your body, you were in the hospital, you flew out of the hospital, and then suddenly you were sucked into this void and you encountered these beings who laughingly told you 
You're nothing. Your life is nothing. Your baby is nothing. This is all just a joke that you're playing on yourself. Fill me in on what I'm missing about that story, but that's essentially it? That's, that's essentially it. Um, the entities were circles. I mean, they. now I would say they were the yin-yang symbols because that's what they looked like. At the time, I had, I did not, no, I did not recognize them. If I had recognized them, I would have had no way of interpreting them. Can I ask you, because in reading through the book and some other, other interviews you've done, what kept playing on my mind is, what do you think about those entities or the that encounter now in terms of its religious or cultural context. What, what does that mean that these were from an, another culture, and in particular, a, a Buddhist or a Taoist culture? What do you make of that today, now, in 2012? I marvel. I have not the foggiest notion how a Taoist symbol would get into the experience of an uninformed New England Congregationalist. Um, But on the other hand, I don't know how religious symbols of any tradition cross into other traditions. You know, I have to say, when I was reading your book, I was kind of going through the, what's the big deal here? Other than your personal experience, which I understand is is huge, you know, (laughs) incredibly significant for you, but I kind of felt like, aren't we past this? I mean, we know that there's these distressing near-death experiences, and they've kind of happened before, but then one quote I think did stick out to me where I felt like maybe I get a sense for where she's pushing against or, or what some of the frustration is. It's a quote from Ken Ring in 1994. He said, Frightening NDEs are themselves illusionary phantasmagories thrown up by the ego in response to the threat of its own seeming eminent annihilation. Oh my gosh, what a bunch of gobbledygook. But tell me what you think. I think maybe that's true, but if it's true of distressing experiences, why wouldn't it be equally true of the blissful experiences? In another place, another context, he has called these um, drug reactions. Well, women in childbirth under, under the same circumstances have radiant experiences, blissful, wonderful, fabulous experiences, and he never said they were just phantasmagories. So I think if it's true in one set of circumstances, why not the other? Back when I first started with the research on all of this, everybody was looking at the radiant experiences. Pretty much everybody still does because they're the ones that we like to think about. These are much more difficult, but it doesn't mean they are without meaning, and it doesn't mean they are without huge significance, particularly um, if you look at this in the social context of the numbers, the countless numbers of people who are out there absolutely terrified of the idea that they may go to hell. Those are the people I am writing for. Right. So that's kind of an interesting point and an interesting perspective in that uh, you're kind of calling out this glorification of the near-death experience, positive experiences that uh, doesn't allow these the full range of these experiences to come through. And what you're, what you're pointing out is how devastating that can be to someone who's had a distressing near-death experience, and yet 
not only are they being uh, rejected and having a hard time getting through to people f from a materialistic background, maybe they're doctors or, or other people in their life, but then when they encounter people in the near-death experience community, there's, they're also shunned maybe by this idea that, oh, well, you must have done something wrong or or the, it's not really like that. So is, is that partly what you were getting at, I guess? Yes, that... Um, in in no way to discount the wonderfulness of of the blissful experiences, but simply to say there are other kinds of experience also, and if we don't talk about them, then how is anyone to know how to respond if they have one? It's like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which essentially is um, a manual of what to expect when you're dying. And maybe some of it will be pleasant and some of it probably won't be. And hey, get this into your subconscious now so that when you encounter it, you'll know how to respond. And we just, we send ourselves out into the experience of, of dying or near death or whatever but in a way that we wouldn't send Boy Scouts into the woods. We want them at least to have a compass. I'm just trying to provide a compass. Okay, but, but there's, there's a problem there, too, because on one hand, I understand the need to talk about it, the need to put it on the table and process it. But I don't think that's the only thing that you're objecting to, because I think you're also objecting, uh, well, I'm going to test this out, this theory of mine, but the, the way that we talk about it. And I'm objecting to the way that we talk about it as well. I want to read for you another quote that maybe will tee off this other little pathway we're going to go down. And it's from, of course, you know, Dr. Barbara Romer, who investigated these distressing near-death experiences and near-death experience researcher. And she came to this conclusion. Let me read her quote. It appears that disavowing the reality or possibility of the existence of a higher power may contribute to the why of these distressing near-death experiences. 19.4% of my study group labeled themselves as atheist or agnostic prior to their experience. I think this is exactly the kind of talking about this stuff that we don't need to do. What the heck could this possibly mean? I like the 19.4. The it's not 19. It's not 20. It's 19.4. Oh, Alex, what... There is so much on on every side of this issue. We are surrounded by people whose knees are jerking. Right. There are automatic responses that people make. The convicted atheists say, oh, it's just these people are, are deluding themselves with the supernatural and the convinced metaphysicians of whom Barbara Romer was one says, oh, if only they believed, then it would be different. And the, the doctrinally religious say, well, if they just believed the right stuff, then that would take care of this. And I think the most frustrating aspect of this whole study is simply trying to get people to sit quietly and just listen to the experiences, let go of their preconceptions for a few minutes, and just sit quietly and think, huh, what could this mean? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. And there's a there's a fine line there because I think we all appreciate 
one, that we're embedded in this materialistic culture who constantly repeats back to us that this is impossible, this is ridiculous, right. you're, you're crazy. So I think when people break through that, then there's a certain need to go just as far as they can with this. And I can appreciate that because it also serves this deep need that we have to answer these questions, and we all want to answer them, so it's kind of hard to pull in the reins. But to an extent, it leaves us with what can we really say at the end of the day? I mean, we can say that materialism is clearly a failed proposition, and that to the extent that, that we're still mired in it, we need to consider what lies beyond. But I'm not really sure what else we can say beyond that. How do we how do we venture forth into this great territory of of what lies beyond? How do we get there? You, you think I have an answer for that? Yes, yes, I think you do. Um, well, in the, the one of my favorite quotes from Bruce Grayson, when somebody asked him something similar, you know, so what does it mean? And Bruce looked thoughtful and said, as the preeminent researcher in this field for 30-some years, and Bruce said, huh, beats me. And that's, that I think, I think there is no single answer. I think, for me, one of the frustrations, as you've just said, and you're asking a great question, but for me, one of the frustrations is the numbers of people who, given a little bit of information, will jump in and say, oh, I get it. I had one of these experiences. I can tell you what it means. But I think we are still following breadcrumbs through the woods. I think we are, too. But I have to say, I'm, I'm equally frustrated with Bruce's answer as well, which you also hear from the near-death experience researchers, particularly ones like Bruce, who are fully embedded in our academic community, and they have a certain role to play there, and I understand that. And that's to say that I know, and I don't know why he says that. Maybe he really, maybe he really means it beats me. But uh, to me, that, that's a certain bit of a cop-out in that I think we're driven to follow those breadcrumbs and to broaden our perspective beyond near-death experience. I think you allude to this a couple times in the book, and it's interesting in the little bit of pre-interview conversation we had, I told you I wanted to uh, bring up Dr. Rick Strassman in the DMT spirit molecule thing, because I think the whole psychedelics is a whole other interesting aspect to this other kind of experience. But there's all sorts of these transformative experiences then I think when we look at them across the board, we might not be able to come to these concrete answers, but I think we can do a little bit better than beats me. I think there is a pattern here that's emerging. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, I have to say, though, Alex, if anybody has been following breadcrumbs for three decades, it's Bruce Grayson, who has both built a foundation and has broadened the expanse of what we're looking at. When he says beats me, it doesn't mean we don't know anything. It means we don't have ultimate answers. A lot of folks out there would like to say, oh, we understand this. We need all the disciplines in this we can get to join us. Because this, this can't be just near-death experiences. It's, it's biochemistry, it's, it's the mythology, mythological information, it's transpersonal psychology, it's sociology, it's anthropology, it's all of them, because that's how big the implications are. I'm sorry, I interrupted there in my defense of Bruce, and you were going on to a question about DMT. No, no, fair enough, and I'm, I'm glad you, you straightened that out, and, and that's great. So please continue on with 
a, a little bit of that kind of cross fertilization that we can get into, and and that's to talk about DMT or uh, psychedelic experience in general, and how that might inform our understanding of near death experience. You know, one of the things I found really interesting in talking to Strassman is that the the surprise finding for him was freestanding entities, if you will. Some time back, um, for several years, I was working um, some, studying some mindfulness meditation with the American Buddhist teacher, uh, Shinzen Yang. And he tells this story of, um, as you get into advanced meditation, you may begin to encounter these creaturely entities, and they can be quite frightening. They seem to be absolutely real, and some of them are insectoid. He tells the story of of himself um, encountering, in a deep meditation, once encountering things like six-foot-tall grasshoppers. And he says, you know, don't worry. Just don't worry. You're not going crazy. You're not being assailed by demons. This is simply your subconscious just divesting itself of, of some imagery. The thing that made Strassman stop his experiment was because that's precisely the kind of encounter that some of his study participants were having. Right. You, you know, uh, uh, Sin Jen Young is a very interesting guy. He's been a guest on this show. I, I have to say, I find that, I find that answer unsatisfying. Uh, he, he, he may be right. He may be completely right. But it, it, I don't know where that gets us. I look at it from this world, from this reality, which may not be a reality at all. I'll accept that going in. But I say, why would these cross-cultural, cross-time entities appear in all these different situations exactly as they are? Freestanding, free-formed, interacting with these individuals to say, okay, don't worry, go past it. If you're talking about how to uh, 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 kind of practical means to advance your meditation, fine. But I'm curious to stop there and say, wait a minute, what does that mean in terms of how I'm supposed to understand this reality? <laughs> and what a very good question, to which I do not have a very good answer, because I think what I rather think of these, I mean, if I'm going in in this world levels, deal with this, all of these ideas and things, would I rather think of these as actual physical entities uh, or as images from the imaginal realms? Now, experientially, I think it doesn't make one bit of difference whether they're physically real or experientially real. If they feel real at that level, they are real. And what does that mean? Um, I'm back to the Bruce Grayson Mm -hmm. kind of answer that says, well, I don't really know what it means in ultimate terms, but by golly, that sure is interesting. Yeah, (laughs) right. Well, you know, and maybe that moves us into the last area that I wanted to talk about. I Another former guest on this show and someone you uh, reference in the book is PMH Atwater, of course, a near-death experience researcher, long time, been at it, written many books. And one of the things that Atwater said in our interview that I thought really she made an excellent point on is really looking at the long-term effects. And she's the first one that I know of who's really said, here's something we have to really put on the table in the same way they're talk- that you're talking about putting distressing near-death experiences on the table. And that is that 
the aftermath of these near-death experiences isn't so neat and rosy like we'd like to think it is. And people are challenged by these experiences and challenged mightily. And they go through some real uh, challenging times in terms of integrating this into their, into their life experience. And she is absolutely right. So much of what people like to think about when they think about spirituality is a kind of Thomas Kincaid spirituality. It's all going to be so sweet. It's just, it's going to be cozy. It's going to be supportive. It's going to be just wonderful. And in plain fact, St. Paul was not far wrong when he said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. <laughs> right. Because, yes, it can be glorious, it can be comforting, it can, it can be wonderful things. It's not always going to be pretty. It may be glorious. But glorious comes at a price, too, and the price is very frequently that you wake up after your radiant experience and you have just been to, with people you dearly love who have died, you have been in the presence of whatever it is you consider most holy. You have been in the presence of peace and ultimate home, and you wake up and you're lying on the pavement, and it's still Tuesday. And your understanding has been transformed, but theirs hasn't. Let's put it this way. There is a psychotherapist now out there in California. You understand, I say now out there from coastal North Carolina. Yes. Um, a, true, a true Easterner yes, out there in California. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, Alex Lukeman, who is quoted at considerable length in, in the book, has talked about near death and similar experiences as being, and I'm, I'm going to quote him. The destruction of traditional and habitual patterns of perception and understanding, including religious belief structures and socially accepted concepts of the nature of human existence and behavior. Now get that. That means your conception of everything has just been blown sky high. Nancy, since you touched on it, I want to bring up how you have resolved this or whether or not you have resolved it with your traditional Christian upbringing. Oh no, Calvin was right. Predestination, which is the idea that God has decided beforehand who will be saved and who will not. And I obviously, coming out of this experience, I was not on the right side of God. Um, so that explains why I am no longer in a Calvinist <laughs> theological <laughs> setting, right. because I just I was incapable of accepting a God who would do that. But for really going to be honest, aren't there some deeper? Uh, doctrinal problems with Christianity. And that's not to say that, as you suggested earlier, there aren't breadcrumbs, there aren't morsels that may turn out to be deep spiritual truths. I totally accept that. But I think in the way that it's constituted, in the way that it's presented, at least down at the church that I go to, that I can't join because I'm not a Christian. I can't stand up there and say the Apostles' Creed and say that I believe any of these things, but I accept the possibility that there is Christ consciousness, that I might be able to interact with that Christ consciousness, but I'm really at a loss for uh, resolving that with modern American, Western Christianity, who claims a, a primacy, a, a superiority, or or even even a historical 
significance in terms of the resurrection or anything like that. I think all that stuff just doesn't make any sense in this context. I hear you loud and clear. As I look, I see more and more people walking out of the theological woods saying exactly those things. It's an interesting and extremely challenging time to be in, to be trying to make it successfully in in the great majority of Christian churches because there is this tension between orthodox doctrine, orthodox wording, and what some of us look at and say, this just does not begin to do it. But on the other hand, you've got increasing numbers of evangelicals saying, I don't think I can do this anymore. Mm -hmm. This is not fitting. This does not feel right. This is not the God I want to worship, or I can worship, or I can believe. And then as you move into the more open structures, you begin to find people saying, you know, it's not about doctrine. It's about how are you living your life? How are you interacting with creation? You know, it's amazing to me that many folks still don't see the way out that you're painting. And I always point people to, and again, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I'm really drawn to people like uh, uh, Brian McLaren. Oh, heavens, yes a new kind of Christianity, and just a couple things where he says, you know, how do you look at the Bible? Do you look at it as an encyclopedia beginning to end that tells us everything we know, or a library where we can go and pull bits and pieces out and use them however we will? And the other thing I think that's part of that progressive Christianity that, again, I can't say I'm a part of, but I see it heading in a direction that that is certainly encouraging, and that's to say that we have to fully embrace, fully embrace our other religions, our other traditions, not in a way of, yeah, you can be here too, but in a way of, yes, you're, you're, you're just as true or maybe more true than me, so great, let's, let's all join in this thing together. It's, it's kind of like um, being in a chorus and the sopranos aren't altos, and the altos aren't tenors who aren't baritones. But without all the voices, you don't have the finished product. I'm a mezzo. Well, I used to be a mezzo. To say that we're the only ones who really have the right voices. Well, how impossibly narrow. Yeah. And how impossibly crippling. I'm equally distressed for and by the militant atheists whose anger at religion is so extreme that it is paralyzing their their intellectual functioning. You know, but the interesting thing about that, and it took me a long time to realize, they're like the bullies who are really protecting the upstanding citizens that allow the bullies to patrol the neighborhood because it really kind of works to their advantage. And uh, I think the scientific community is standing right behind on the sideline and seeing the, the atheist bullcrap that goes on. And it totally, it totally serves as cover for them because materialism the, the end of materialism is the end of atheism. It, it, it just get because it doesn't go away, it just gets so marginalized and put over there in the corner, they become the Flat Earth Society. But as long as science continues to prop them up and say, oh no, yeah, there's still some validity there, I and mean, that's what really ferments the whole thing. For years, I have been so fascinated by the fact that if you look way over to the left or way over to the right, you see people saying the same things about near-death experiences, for example. Exactly. The scientists say, well, nobody can fly through the sky. They can't be seeing their bodies. That's not true. And over at the other end, the guys are saying, well, that can't be true. That's just not doctrinal. 
Well, and they're, they're also, I think the deeper thing that I've found, or my opinion, is that what they're both doing is defending the status quo. I mean, they're first of all just defending their, their existing beliefs because it's painful for any of us to change our beliefs. But the consequence is they're defending the status quo and that's why they get fed. That's why we keep feeding them because we need the status quo to go on. We need the culture of materialism needs to support the science philosophy of materialism or the whole thing kind of yeah. grinds to a halt. So do you see a way past that? No, I don't. I mean, not in any short term. I mean, one of the, the frustrations I have is, is when people talk about the paradigm shift that's eminent and all that. It's like, you know, go tell William James about the eminent <laughs> paradigm shift. <laughs> yes. It's that sentimental passionate desire for things to be nice. Right. And we'll just we'll just have this evolution of consciousness mm -hmm. and then the golden edge will be here and let's see it's Tuesday. If we do this right it should be here by the end of the year. You know, Nancy, that's a very interesting parallel to what you're talking about with the distressing near-death experiences and that we have to it let in, if not fully embrace, maybe we have to fully embrace the dark, but we have to at least let it into the conversation and not Bingo. pretend that it's not there. Yep, you got it. Absolutely on target. Yes. Well, Nancy, it's been just a delight talking to you. Again, the book, for those who are interested in finding out more about these distressing near-death experiences and understanding the whole near-death experience phenomena and the history of the research from someone who's been at it for a very long time and had a very unique perspective in seeing it all evolve, you have to check out Dancing Past the Dark, Distressing Near-Death Experiences. Nancy, thanks again for joining me. Alex, thank you so much. Thanks again to Nancy Evans-Bush for joining me today on Skeptico. There's a couple of questions that I'd like to tee up for discussion from this interview. And they both center around this idea of how do we approach the paranormal? How do we deal with topics that mainstream science is telling us are impossible or, or at least certainly not proven? And yet we know from looking at the evidence are very, very well established. So how do we work in this space where we have this force on one side that's telling us, no, 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 this is not happening. So how do we avoid going too far to the other extreme and saying, no, not only is it true and real, but it's all true and it's all real. How do we keep that filter at just the right level and not go too far beyond the data, if you will? And I guess the second question has to do with applying that principle to these questions of distressing NDEs. What can we say about these malevolent forces, whether you think they're spiritual or whether you think they're demonic or wherever? I think we have to go there to some extent. We have to at least explore that territory and find out if there is any there there. So the second question I'd like to tee up for you is, how do we process this evil factor into the equation? So I'd love to hear what you think. Comment right there on the Skeptico website at skeptiko.com. Join the forum. Let us know what you think there. Send me an email, however you do it. Love to hear from you. Hey, while you're at the website, please check out all of our other shows, over 175 and counting. Plenty more coming. Tell your friends about Skeptico. Let's get other people involved. Spread the word as much as you think is appropriate. And I guess that's about all for today. Take care. Until next time, bye for now.